you don't know every person in your audience. There's a business card sitting in your audience that could be a gig that pays 10 times as much as the one you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And again, if you say something in the context of your show that makes them not want to use you or any other comic for the next five years, right. you'll never know what, what that material cost you. Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by SchoolofLaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. Welcome to today's podcast. Rick Roberts here. Special thanks goes out to our Patreon supporter for this episode, Ray Price. How's it going, Ray? Uh, thanks for supporting the podcast through Patreon. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out schooloflast.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Uh, the podcast is supported by listeners and by sponsors. We're also sponsored this week by the Clean Comedy Challenge. Go to cleancomedychallenge.com and check out all the information about upcoming challenges. Uh, three different locations across the country, West Coast, uh, out in Nevada, and... One here in Nashville, Tennessee. You'll hear a little ad in the middle of the episode for that. So tune in all the way through. Make sure you get more details. But cleancomedychallenge.com is where you go for that information. Hey, I've got a fun episode today. My buddy Mark Klein from Louisville joins me. Mark started comedy in the 70s when he was in college. And then I went full time in 1980. He was there to witness and be part of the comedy boom where there was more comedy stages than there were comedians who could perform on them. Can you even imagine that? He was in a seller's market, not a buyer's market, and he was able to fill up his calendar with one fell swoop of a pen, and uh, boom, he was out there and working and, and getting it done. He talks about, uh, you know, he started out in comedy doing stand-up, then he did a comedy duo for a while with Bob Batch, very funny guy from Louisville as well. Then he uh, perfected his nightclub act, which was a you know, pretty hard-hitting act then moved into corporate. He talks about the challenges and the transition of doing that. And also is a very humble and very insightful telling us, you know, what he may have done differently. Even though he's got no regrets, there's always things you could look back and maybe could have advanced your career faster if you'd done them earlier. And he's kind enough to share that here in this episode as well. So that's coming up in just a second. I did want to let you know about some upcoming shows that you could come out and see me and say, hey, if you're in the Nashville area, I'll be back at TBN Studios warming up the Huckabee audience on April 20th. I'll be in Memphis at Central Church. Uh, it's actually Collierville, Tennessee, but it's right there by Memphis with a laugh all night along with Brian Bates. That show is at 7 o'clock on April 27th. You can find out more about that by clicking into the show notes. I'll also be doing a fundraiser in Joplin, Missouri on the 28th. Details about that will be in the show notes as well. Uh, back at Huckabee on May 3rd and 4th. And then, let's see, another opportunity to see me May 10th out in Crossville, Tennessee, as well as a fundraiser in Boston area on the 11th of May, 19th in Louisville, Kentucky at Night of a Thousand Laughs to raise money for Gilda's Club, and then again back at Huckabee on May 24th. All right, uh, let's get into the episode right now with Mark Klein, and I'll talk to you on the flip side. <laughs> How's it going this morning, sir? Not a complaint in the world. Here's what I need in life, Rick. A smarter dog and a faster horse. I'm in a big partnership with a very slow horse down in Louisiana. And uh, we're at the point now where we're timing her workouts with a sundial. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just Is that a good, huh? brutal business. But, it... You know, I'm, I'm a Kentuckian, so that's what we do. Is it like a timeshare horse where you like you got to find somebody to buy you out of it? it? It's a miracle of God's creation. Here's what a thoroughbred <laughs> racehorse is. It is a four-legged animal, four-hoofed animal, actually. And you feed it a bucket of $100 bills. Then you walk behind it, and it's crapped a $5,000 problem. It's a miracle. <laughs> yeah. the, the animal's just a miracle of creation. It is pretty crazy. I've worked on Dan Issel's horse farm in Kentucky in, for sales for a long time. Did you? Yeah, eight years probably. Amazing. And I learned a lot about how much money goes into it. Uh, it was basically 80 bucks a day just to keep a horse in the stable. Yeah. You know, he had thoroughbreds, and Don King's mom kept some horses there. Yeah. And so that she would come in twice a year, and they had to polish all the brass and everything, and she'd barely even take a look in there. You know, among guys in it at my level, it doesn't it doesn't matter what you pay for them; it's what it costs to keep them. Because mm -hmm. a five thousand dollar claiming horse costs just as much to feed, train as a hundred thousand dollar stakes horse. So if you want to run those numbers, 
any public trainer at a major track like Churchill Downs is going to charge $125 a day to feed, groom, and train his horse. And that doesn't include vet bills, new shoes, and all that. Right. That's $35,000, $4,000 a month. You're talking $50,000 a year to keep a lousy horse. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you pay for them. It's what they cost to keep. How much does it t- cost to take them behind the track and shoot them? Well... You may call a guy to break his leg. <laughs> price of a bullet, but no one wants that to happen. No. They, uh, they, when they do what they're trained to do, they're extraordinarily beautiful animals, and they're, they're, there's a connection with horses that you get with no other animal in the world. It, it, it's an amazing sport to be part of. So that's how I'm doing. That's pretty good. Well, like you say, there could be bigger problems to have, I guess. There are indeed. So you just came through, uh, you said you had a couple of fundraisers in Pittsburgh last night. A couple shows up in Pittsburgh for a uh, uh, Comedy comedian friend of mine who turned into a booking agent and started a large agency that does clean material fundraisers, which is a specialty now. And as you know, from having come up in the nightclub comedy business to an extent, uh, as you get older, you begin to realize, unless you're a TV star, the money is in working clean hmm. and doing corporate events and, and that type of thing instead of grinding it out on the club circuit one night at a time. Which, if you're 25 and want to live in your car, it's great, it's fun. No way to feed a family, but it's it's a fun way to live for a couple of years. But right. Then, then you grow up. Yeah. And you did a lot of that back in the I, day. I sure did. When was your, I mean, first time on stage? How many years ago? What oh, year was goodness. it? Uh, my first time on stage, intentionally trying to be funny for people I did not know, uh-huh. was in college. This would be back in 1973, 74. Then when I got out of college, um, I started kicking around town doing some events I created myself. And about 1980, I became a professional comedian full-time, began to make my living telling jokes in the burgeoning comedy club world, which was at that point just starting to really take off. And you were, what, 27, 28, somewhere around there? 26 years old, starting full-time comedy. Now, a lot of people have heard about the glory days of walking into TSM and there's calendars on the wall with the name of the club and you put your name on it. That's right. So tell me about that. Cause part of that, it sounds, uh, cause I came in after that, obviously. Uh, but there's almost a legendary myth. I'm trying to get the facts here. Cause you were in the heartbeat of that. Cause you know, Tom was your guy for a while, right? Tom Sobel and I'm still very close yeah. friends and he was my primary agent for many years. Most artists, uh, wh- whether you're in music, comedy, opera, doesn't matter unless you're, getting famous through media. Most artists never experience a seller's market for talent, only a buyer's market for mm-hmm. talent. Same is true of, of speakers as well, as you, as you know. Um, comedy booking in about 1980 was a seller's market for talent. They were opening comedy clubs in every city and suburb in the country, and if you had a 30 to 45-minute act, guess what? You're a headliner in Carbondale, Illinois next week. <laughs> right. And you would walk into Tom Sobel's office, And Tom, at that time, uh, was developing one of the biggest comedy booking agencies in the country, in Louisville, of all places, not New York or Los Angeles. Right, which I always thought was kind of crazy, but that's just the way it happened. An amazing feat on his part to have done so. And uh, because Tom had a management relationship with me, it was, Mark, how many weeks do you want to work and where do you want to go? And we would simply fill out the calendar. Um, The money was good enough. Mm-hmm. It wasn't millionaire money, but it was good enough to feed a single guy on the road all he could eat, drink, and party on week to week. And you also had the freedom at that time because so many clubs are opening up around the country. I'd go to Florida in the wintertime, mm-hmm. go to the horse tracks down there, spring and summer, come up to the Midwest, wintertime, back to Florida. You spend your winters where it's warm, your summers where it's uh, comfortable, and that's how you ran your, your career. That's pretty great. It was great. Yeah, and you were part of a comedy team back in the day, too. I had a partner for two years, Bob Batch, who is still a good friend of mine and remains one of the funniest people I know. You know, uh, when I need someone to make me laugh, Mm -hmm. I call Bob. He makes me laugh to this day. We've been friends for 35 years. And did you start off stand-up and then meet Bob and develop a duo act, or how did it all come around? we kind of developed our comedy careers at the same time, and we went. We were going to the same amateur nights and open mic nights, and let's put on a comedy show here. And I, I was doing a show in a nightclub here in Louisville, and he came to see it. He was a, in a band, and he was the funny guy in the band. And we met each other and liked each other immediately. We're completely opposite in comedy style and personality. We got along great, and we had a, a, a close friendship relationship as well as a comedy relationship. And when we went on the road as a team... The dynamic was Bob is a funny voice, funny face, uh, um, physical comic. Mm-hmm. I do more, I'm more of a wordsmith and a storyteller. And so those two styles we blended in act where I was mostly the straight man and he was mostly the funny guy. 
But when we went and do a 45 to 60 minute show together, we would go on stage with a team act for two minutes. One guy would throw the other guy off stage with a comedy bit. You'd have the stage to yourself for 25 minutes, uh-huh. a bit that interrupts that comedy team together for two or three minutes. Other guy gets the stage alone for 25 minutes, then a closing bit. And it was a great one hour show. We both got the chance to shine as solo acts and do our team act together. That's smart. Yeah, I never knew how that worked out with you guys. That's clever to throw each other out so you have your own time for a little while. I mean, it makes the most sense. Plus, you're using, you know, at that point, you didn't have probably a 60-minute duo act to no, pull from. Or maybe even a 60-minute solo act. Maybe you're right there. So it was a nice way to kind of blend the two, huh? You could develop your act and still learn the <clears throat> dynamics of team comedy, which is a completely different animal for being a solo act. And uh, for, you know, most comics that are single stand-ups, as I am now, as, as you are, mm-hmm. you're a bit of a control freak. You need to make sure the sound's right, the light's right. There's not a syllable. I've seen your show. There's not a syllable in your act that that is not supposed to be there. Right. It looks like you're just doing this off the cuff. That's because you've done it 10,000 times off the cuff, and there's not a word in your show that's not there for a reason. When you're at a comedy team, there's that, plus you're ceding control of your act and career to someone else for a certain period of time. And that's hard for a solo performer to do. So I learned an awful lot about team dynamic working with Bob. Great experience. Yeah. Yeah, a similar thing with the Midwest Comedy Tool and Die Improv. Like, because I had just started doing a little bit of stand up and then they're like, hey, come on the road with us. 50 weeks. Let's go. I'm like, oh. And it was a blessing, you know, but I had to learn how to like fit into that dynamic. They already had a program, a 90 minute show that didn't include me and I had to find my way in there and a little bit of give and take with all that stuff. And it can be. There can be friction for sure. Yep. You know, sometimes you're just about to deliver a great line and all of a sudden they ask a question that means nothing and stops everything. <laughs> and I, I'm sure I did that more to them than they did to me. Did you guys have, I'm sure there's a little bit of like brotherly friction on the road sometimes? More than a little. Yeah. Um, that our friendship survived it and is stronger now than it was not working together says a lot about how much we're willing to put into the relationship outside of our comedy lives. Um it, it's difficult. It's a marriage, and mm-hmm. it has to be worked on like a marriage. Have you guys done any kind of? Didn't you do a, a reunion of so, some sorts at some point in the past couple of years? We did. We still do shows together every now and again. Uh, we do a little bit of our team stuff, but it's mostly our solo acts just together on the same bill. Mm-hmm. And we, we, I still enjoy traveling with Bob. We'll do an out of town gig sometime. It's just, it's fun. Again, he's 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 a, he's a dear friend of mine, and and just fun to be around. That's pretty cool. And so back in the day, you're 26. You're starting off full time comedian, hitting the road. How far did that road go? Did you hit New York and L.A. a little bit and sample that kind of thing? Or did you find yourself more of a, hey, I'm doing what I like to do already? I, I loved nightclub performing more than anything else I tried. I liked it more than the few television spots I got. I, I didn't like to have my act filtered by a camera or a producer or a director. I liked the immediacy of the response. Mm-hmm. And I just I fell in love with that. And when I went from being a nightclub act to being a clean corporate act, I uh, began to miss that that sexiness of that hot Saturday night crowd. There's nothing like that. A packed out show on a Saturday night in a comedy club right. in a major city. There's nothing like that in the world. So to start doing corporate events, you have to replace that. You have to make the corporate event a home game the same way you felt like that nightclub event was a home game. And after I kind of learned how to do that, uh, a lot of doors began to open up for me in terms of you can make your living in a different way than doing saloon shows every night. Yeah. And it took me... Goodness gracious! I started working cruise ships um, with it, with my show, and so that's taken me to, you know, St. Petersburg, Russia, and Estonia, and Tahiti, and New Zealand, and and Florida. I mean, name it. It takes you around the world. That's pretty cool. Well, give us a few insights on what what helped you make that transition into corporate to where you you, you could get a rush at a corporate show, somewhat close to maybe what a Saturday night show would be in a in a club. But what were some things you kind of honed in on, like? If I'm going to do this, I'm going to, this is a way I can make it fun for me and still win for the client. Because I'm still, I'm still learning in that. There, are, uh, there were a couple things that really jumped out. Number one, I discovered that what they don't hear is as important as what they do hear. Um, because in a corporate setting, unless you're hired for your point of view, I'm hired for my humor. I talk, they laugh. I tell my corporate clients, I don't educate, I don't motivate, I don't train. No one's better off because they came to my show than they were when they went in the door. I <laughs> right. promise you that. I, I talk, you laugh. That's my deal. Unless you're being hired for a specific point of view, no one in a corporate audience needs to hear about your your personal dysfunction, your political viewpoints, who you hate. They don't want to hear the negativity. They want positivity. Mm-hmm. So what they don't hear is important to what they do hear. 
The other thing that I came to discover in that was as I wanted to write a show that was appropriate for a resort, a corporate show, a, a country club, as well as a comedy club, I needed a different kind of approach to my act. So instead of calling my corporate, instead of saying I have a corporate show and it was just a cleaned up version of my stand up mm -hmm. nightclub show, I wrote a corporate show that my nightclub show is a spiced up version of that. Those are two different shows. Gotcha. So, um, what, and what triggered that was when I got married and had uh, a child, my dad was still alive, loved, loved the comedy business, and I wanted a show that my father and son could come to, sit next to each other, and enjoy equally. And that was not the nightclub act I was doing <laughs> right. when I got married. And that that sent me on kind of a different path. Yeah. How many years did it take you to think where you kind of got really comfortable doing the corporate thing and like, and you had that full hour where your dad and your son could come out and see it? Yeah, about two years. Two years, yeah. I'd, I'd say between a year and two years. It was an evolution, not a creation. Didn't happen. The week, I didn't sit down and write it in a week. But once I got it down, I, I discovered some interesting things. There were laughs in my show that I never knew were there because they were being masked by either language or values issues that were part of my nightclub act. And so my act got longer, not shorter, because I was cleaning it up. Hmm, interesting. It doesn't happen to most comics. It right. To me, though, it was very, very, very interesting for me. And I began to um, to write to that, and I, I began to have confidence in different material. I know this stuff is going to do well, uh, not I hope this stuff is going to do well. And you end up with a 45-minute show of clean material that you feel that way about every bit in that in that show. Right. And you've obviously done it for a long time, since the 70s. How do you keep your mind sharp? Let me let me jump into that really quick, because you've done a good job of that. Um, I quit drinking six years ago. That's been most helpful uh, in keeping, keeping the fog off the, off the meadow. Uh, my, the things that, that I'm passionate about that are not comedy-related, thoroughbred horse racing, for example... Uh, that's a that's not a business for dummies. You got to you know to read a racing form. You got to have something going on. Mm -hmm. um, just I, I'm a ferocious reader. I'm reading something. I read a lot of history, a lot of nonfiction. Um, so I, I do a lot of that. Uh, and I, I try to do a, a hard Sudoku uh, once a day. Just little mental gymnastics to make sure you can still do the push-ups in your head that you have to stay in shape to go do your act. That's cool. So as comedians, I mean, if, if this goes, if our brain goes, it all goes. My father had a great saying, you know, you, you've seen my act. I, I, I adore my dad. He passed away a year and a half ago, and, and I, I, we were very close. And I, he told me, you're in show business, son, so you're the only inventory your business has. Yeah, think about that for a second. So, yeah, yeah. take care of yourself. Take care, you know, eat right, work, keep stay, exercise, because you're the inventory. There's no there's no shelf full of goods you can go sell. It's you. It's hey, in your ears. Your take overhead is in your head. That's exactly a good way to put it. Exactly right. How much material do you have on call in your in your mind? Like you're doing these cruise ships now. I'm sure you have multiple shows. I do. Um, My cruise ship clients require a squeaky clean show, at least an hour of material. Um, and I've probably got a nine, 90 minutes of, of comfortable, confident, family, clean material. Mm -hmm. um, some of my cruise ship clients also would like an adult show for a late night show. And I've got probably another 60 full minutes of that available. So you're talking between two and two and a half hours of material that I don't have to sit down and write it out and make sure I've got it. I've got it. Right. No work. And I can access it just standing up there and talking. Then if I have a client that requires they want material that is custom written for their company or their industry, then I'll do a little bit of research, drill down and, and find the nuggets that I want to put in there and, and custom write for them. Yeah. I know that a few times I've done cruise ships. The one thing I, I like the challenge of is, you know, you'd have basically three shows, you know, your w welcome aboard show where you do 15 minutes right. or less. So you still have to have a good opening and a good closer. And then the second show, I'm like, oh, I've already used my good opening and my good closer. <laughs> and then so you've got an hour where you got to open and close strong. And then sometimes the night before the, the ship pulls in the harbor, they do another 20-minute send-off where they kind of recap yeah. everybody. So I remember the uh, the first time I did that, I was sitting there with my notebooks going, all right, do I really have – and I realized that the, the one great opener I had in the clubs forever was super, but I, it was so good I never replaced it or tried anything else. And so I, I was challenged in that week to kind of figure out how can I – create a new opener and then I really learned after that every time I hit the stage you know I can use my real opener as my second line 
and try a new opener in that first spot because it's still almost conversational to the audience when you first hit the stage, you know? Do you uh, find that you've written some stuff specifically for cruises? Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the cruise ship uh, calendar has replaced my nightclub calendar. Uh, I do about 14 to 16 weeks a year on cruise ships. And cruise ship audiences have a couple things that are unique to them. Number one, no one in your audience is on their cell phone. Yeah. No one's checking their Facebook feed while you're telling your... What, what a relief you know, that is. Oh, it's great. You don't see that little underlight under their chin <laughs> yeah. coming up from their... Uh, so that's terrific. Secondly, you're performing to an international audience, mm -hmm. even out of American ports. I, I work a lot of ships out of Miami. And you'll hit a week out of Miami where 25% of your audience is of Indian or Pakistani descent with families, 25 to 30 people per family. This is their vacation cruise. And they're in your audience. So how does your act translate to that? Right. And that's a great, great experience as well. Also, depending on what cruise line you're working for, you've got different people in the audience. For if you're on Holland America, for example, their their market are seniors. The average cruise on Holland America ships over 55, probably into their 60s or 70s, depending on what time of year it is. That's a different audience from a Norwegian cruise line ship in the middle of the summer where there's a lot of families and teenagers and whatnot in your audience. So that, that educates you as well as to how universally appealing you need to make your act. And do you find that uh, probably the common thing, no matter regardless of what your audience is like, is relationships, family, uh, you know, between you and your son or you and your wife, that translates across cultures? It does. I was I was pleasantly surprised to see material about my wife, my kid, my dog, you know, mm -hmm. work for that audience. But you also have a chance within the framework of your show, if you're if you're if you can write to it, to educate people into a hidden world that you know about and they don't and make it accessible to them through humor. For example, I do a routine about thoroughbred horse racing and owning a racehorse. Well, that's hidden world to most people, mm -hmm. how that, all that works. I have a comedy bit about it that makes it accessible to them, and it's a very popular part of my show. And I also have a, for my nightclub show, I have a comedy routine on the, the horse breeding industry, which uh, is <laughs> right. a different set of material. <laughs> yeah. It's not a corporate bit, but it's a great nightclub bit. And right. On certain cruise ships, you can work that in as well. So That's funny. Yeah, the... Uh... Yeah, the days on the horse farm, seeing the teaser horse come oh, in, and the, it was just, uh, I felt bad for every, all parties involved, <laughs> including the farmhand who had to ride the teaser horse back to the <laughs> paddock after the, the whole experience. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so when you do your cruise ships, are they, like you said, you've gone all around the world with them. Are there places you haven't gone yet that you know there's an itinerary for you're still trying to line up that's on your bucket list? or have yep, you hit, yep, there is. Where do you need to go? Australia, the week of the Melbourne Cup. Oh, man. That's a major horse race in Australia. That's that's their equivalent of the Breeders' Cup or Kentucky Derby. And I'd love to get on a cruise ship. takes me into Melbourne Harbor and uh, pop off, go catch the Melbourne Cup and get back on my ship. Um, I've, no, I've, I've been – there's very few places that they haven't taken me. There's a few I want to go back to. Mm -hmm. But my cruise ships have taken me to South America, uh Alaska? Oh, yeah. I've been pretty, in the last five or ten. They can't show you how pretty it is. Yeah. Tahiti, they can't show you how pretty it is. Yeah. You look at all the pictures you want. You've got to go there to see how beautiful it is yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the comedy career has allowed me to do. I've been able to take my family to the Bahamas uh, for two weeks every summer for the last 20 years. Uh, it's taken me around the world on the most luxurious cruise ships in the world. Paid to go there. Get to tell jokes to people. Get a check waiting when I get home. Who's going to argue with that? That's pretty good. So it's allowed me to, to present the world to my family in a way that I couldn't have had I had uh, what we call a straight job. Yeah. And you always think it's like, that was a more glamorous way to say it. I'm always like, I'm a trucker with jokes. I get to see the country. <laughs> but I think the way you present it, I'm going to I'm gonna remind my wife that that's what I'm doing. I'm doing what Mark Klein just said. <laughs> hey, I'm going to pop in here just for a second and let's acknowledge our sponsor, the Clean Comedy Challenge. Comic who wants to take your comedy to the next level, sometimes you need a little help. And that's where the Clean Comedy Challenge comes into play. This is Leslie Norris Townsend, and I'm the creator and producer of this challenging event. This year we have three different locations, each with a cash prize. Two of the three are full-blown three-day events with seminars, critiques, and performances in a real comedy club. Past attendees include Johnny W., Charlene May, Andy Medango, Marty Simpson, and Mike Paramar, all who are now full-time comedians. So if you're ready to take advice from the pros and perform in a real comedy club, go to cleancomedychallenge.com. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. 
And don't forget to mention Rick Roberts School of Laughs so I know where you came from. What are um, some steps you took early on that helped accelerate um, success or maybe some steps you took that, that maybe put the brakes on success? Anything that some new comics listening could maybe they, – they still have to have their own experiences, but I'm just curious if you had some that you recall like, oh, man, I really – that set me back a little bit further than I wanted to. Yes, I, I I did not. I was having so much fun doing a nightclub show. It took me much longer to develop an alternative to that than mm. it should have. That cost me a lot of work. Um, I have no idea how much. I still don't know how much work it cost me, but I know it did, because people I had a very good X-rated nightclub show, and I was known for that. And so again, I didn't stop to think, who's not hiring you? Right. I just thought, who is hiring you? And it it. it that, that was a mistake. I should have taken, when I was in my 20s and 30s, professional acting lessons from someone who knew how to present both stagecraft and television-ready material. Uh, a lot of people are naturally gifted with that knowledge. I'm not one of them. It would have served me much better years and years ago to know how to push my act through a TV camera and have it come out the back end. Uh -huh. um, Again, that's a natural gift to some people. It is not to me, and I would have been well served to have learned that. So having taken some professional dramatic training and television training would have been very useful, and I, I regret that I didn't do it. I probably should have spent more time in media centers like Los Angeles and New York just to have met more people. I, I trusted all that to an agent, which worked out well when the agent was booking the places I wanted to go. But the agent never got me any place I couldn't have gone on my own. And gotcha. I, I did not have that understanding at the time. Looking back, I would have done more to develop management and agent relationships than I did. Um, but do I have any regrets? No. Everything, yeah, I met my wife doing this. Mm -hmm. I've been married for 25 years. Did she see you at a show and then it started there? Here's how I met my wife. Tell it's me. Absolutely true story. Did a comedy show in a nightclub in Savannah, Georgia. She sat in the front row, didn't laugh at a word I said. <laughs> On the way out, I stopped her. I said, excuse me, you didn't much care for me, did you? She said, no, I didn't. We started to talk. And I said, I got more charm in this than a car. I mean, whatever you need to hear, I got. <laughs> I got a line of BS a mile long. And she laughed at that. And that was the end of it. And I was back in Savannah a year later and I managed to reach her call. Her. She came out to the show and we had a couple of dates and we got married four months after that. Oh, wow. 26 years ago. All right. There you go, man. So, uh, you can have regrets, but, you know, the, the great things in my life that, that came to me from comedy, my wife, my kid, I've been doing work that I love for 35 years. Mm -hmm. They pay me to go do something I love every night that I go to work. So uh, not a single regret from that. And I, I'll tell you something else. Uh, they, they Presumably, they pay us to tell jokes and be funny. That's not what we're paid for paid to be away from our families, mm -hmm. paid to be away from your wife and kid, You're paid to miss a birthday party every now and then because you got to feed these people. That's what they pay us to do. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, I think it was, um, David Pendleton. His, I don't know if you know David, he's in Indianapolis, does uh, ventriloquist and him and his wife were at a, a comedy conference I was working at the Christian comedy association. And, and we were talking about, you know, charging and what, what your fee should be or whatever. And some people will want a free show and, and they had a great comment, like, you know, if somebody asked you to do a free show, say, well, I'll be performing for free, but it's costing my family some time away from me. Great and so pay. if at the very least, if you can't pay me, how about a, a gift card for a night out at a nice restaurant with my wife? So she, you know, right. isn't isn't always the victim of me going out and having fun doing what I want to do. It's a smart way to put it. Uh, and I've always had a, I've tried to develop more of a client centered relationship with how much I'm paid. So when someone wants to use me for an event, they specifically want me, not just whoever can show up for whatever the money is. I want them to be happy or they're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. I want to be happy or I'm not going to do it. And if there's a third party, a booker involved, I want them to be happy or they're not going to ever put us together again. So I, I try to focus on money is not the reason I'm going there and it's not going to keep me away from there. The mm -hmm. amount of dollars on the table, for the most part, they don't get me there, and they, but they don't keep me from going there. Is this beneficial to all parties concerned in a way that right. we're all happy? That's how you try to come up with that number that makes sense. Yeah. And I remember maybe it was four or five years ago we did that gig out in California. Bakersfield, California for an oil company. 
Yeah. And what a, oh, that was a great time. That was a fun time. And you had met that guy. He had seen you on a cruise ship and got your card. Is that how I remember yes, working? Uh, yes, he did. Saw me do a show on a cruise ship. Exactly and, right. And so you were nice enough to call me up. And I had never been in Bakersfield. And, of course, I'm a big country music fan, so I had to come out there and see some of the stuff. And But that was a great setup. It had a, the, it was in a theater. Somehow this guy had his corporate event. So let's, let's book the theater. Yep. And you brought me along. And that was... I remember it being a long show. Like this guy wanted like two hours or two and a half hours or something. Took an intermission, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Like forty-five minute sets. Yeah, and I was just impressed that night because uh, it'd been a long time since I'd worked with you. Your memory to to bring all that material through. Because even if somebody said, "Hey, you know, go do your ninety minutes," I still have to kind of brush up a few things, put a few things in order. You know, you that, cr- that gig is an important lesson in a lot of ways. One of which is this. And I try to tell younger comics this. You don't know every person in your audience. There's a business card sitting in your audience that could be a gig that pays 10 times as much as the one you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And again, if you say something in the context of your show that makes them not want to use you or any other comic for the next five years, you'll never know what what that material cost you. You'll know how much fun it was to perform, but you'll never know what it cost you Mm -hmm. because... There's there's someone, and I like to think there's someone in every show that I do, there's someone in that audience who would like to have my act presented somewhere else in their life, at their moose lodge, at their country club, at their corporate event, at their chamber of commerce meeting. That person's out there too. And um, especially when I work a cruise ship and you're exposed to several thousand people in the course of a week, how many of those people have businesses, have regional meetings, belong to associations? So if you come off that ship and you don't have a business card from somebody, you probably haven't maximized your time away from your family yeah. properly. Do you ever, uh, occasionally I'll drop something in my show like, you know, I was out in Kansas doing a fundraiser and just dropped in the fact, hey, just so you know, I do fundraisers. And just plant a couple of seeds so people are like, oh, yeah, we do fundraisers. Do you do anything that? Because <laughs> I, I found that to be pretty effective. <laughs> I forget who said it, but I've heard a quote one time, things that go without saying always go better when you say them. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually I say at the end of my show, I do uh, I do fundraisers, I, I do corporate events, I do chamber of commerce meetings, and I'll go anywhere you have an audience. I do moose, elk, and eagle lodges. If your building has a dead animal over the door, <laughs> I'm your guy. Give me a call. Right. Wait till uh, I show you the picture of the last gig I did. <laughs> there were eight dead animals on the stage behind me. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it is important to maximize your time when you're out. Um, other tips you have for maybe some beginning comics or comics who are starting to cross over in the corporate work? ways you can make the client happy and ways you can kind of maximize the experience. I think the, the, the biggest variety of stages you can get on in the shortest period of time is very, very helpful because what you see, if you stay in the comedy club world, you see guys and women who want to be comics. They come to open mic night. They start to develop two, three, five, six minutes of material, but they stay. That's their stage. That's where they stay. They never break out of that cage. Uh, they might do another comedy event and another comedy club, but that's that's the same stage. That's the same audience, same, it's the same mm-hmm. feeling. You need stages that are that are completely out of bounds from that stuff. I started my career working strip joints. I did more than a few gentlemen's clubs uh, as a comic to start to develop an act. Um, I did a number of shows um, for a company called Elmcroft. They have senior living centers. These aren't nursing homes, but they're people who need some assistance, but are still fairly independent. Well, that audience is between 70 and 90 years old. And to get on stage in front of them is a different, requires a different type of energy, a different approach to your comedy. It has to be a little slower, a little louder, more accessible. Uh-huh. And that's a different experience too. We're well, not going to get that experience doing open mic night at the Chuckle Hut in Carbondale. You've got to go do some of those. Right. And they make you a better comic and they give you a wide. And as it turns out, I did about 30 shows for Elmcroft in a year's period. And they were a substantial part of my income that year. And that's also a very gratifying type of show to do. I had mm. someone come up to me after one of those shows and tell me, I haven't seen my mother laugh in 20 years like that. Well, they can't pay you for that. Right. A check that's going to cover that feeling that gives you. So you have to find as many different venues as you can in as short a period of time as you can. That's great. Yeah, I found, and I'm sure it's just natural as you get older, you want to kind of give back a little bit. And the rewards are more than just the laughs that you're getting, you know, the experiences people are having and being able to adjust and give them the right experience, you know, it takes it takes to a comedy for 15, 20 years sometimes to get there, doesn't it? I wish I'd known it sooner. Again, you asked me what what I've. I wish I'd realized that a lot sooner. I'd have done more free shows in more different places just to just to have done it. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I did a show, the show I did last weekend in Pittsburgh. Never would have dreamed this place existed. The Slovak Catholic Community Center. Really? <laughs> yeah. Carson Street in downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Booker that does, they needed a clean show for a fundraiser for their yeah. gymnastics team. So guess what? There, here I am. Never <laughs> been here before. May never come here again. Having a ball. Loving it. Had halushki, which is noodles, cabbage, and about 14 sticks of butter in a bowl. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, and <laughs> takes you a place you never thought you'd go. <laughs> Sounds like it might take you to the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, you're here in Louisville. Are there places, uh, I'm sure you've been to every state at least a couple times by now, right? Or is there one you just haven't been to? Oh, there's a few. I've never done a show in Idaho. Okay. That's on the list. I'd like to catch that. Uh, Delaware is on that list. A tough one to get. I mm-hmm. uh, haven't done a show in Maine yet. I'd like to catch. Well, I've done it I've done a cruise ship, though, in, in Bangor in Maine. I don't know if that counts or not. There are many, though. I've, I've seen the country and, and, and the world pretty well. Well, yeah. play, And I love traveling. If you don't like to travel, it's not the business for you. You've got to be able to get out of town and go see what there is out there. Right. There's amazing things to see that you'd never see otherwise. You definitely have to get to Idaho. Boise, Idaho is my, one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, back when the Funny Bone had a club there, I would do it probably four weeks a year. Oh, my. And the great thing about that town is everybody lives there because they want to. Nobody is forced to live in Boise, Idaho. But they, they work at night so they can climb the the mountains. You know, they can go snow skiing, water skiing, rock climbing, mountain biking, fishing, hiking. It's all there every day. There's a booker that lives out in that part of the world, and he books Idaho, Montana, you know, these eight-hour drives between one-nighters. And before it's all over with, I'm going to call him and say, Dave, I'll do it for nothing. I need these three states. Right. That's what I need to fill, you know, fill my collection out. Yeah. So just put me on it. Yeah, it's funny. It's Tribble? Is that yeah, the guy? Yeah. yeah, I never did any of his stuff, but I, I, I know he's right up that alley, and people would tell me. You do a gig and you have to get in the car as soon as the gig's over to get to the next gig. That's right. And there's like four days in a row of some of those. Yeah. But you see some beautiful country while you're traveling. That's awesome. Well, we're getting ready to wrap up here. Um, anything on your list that you, not just places you haven't been, but a show type you'd like to do or a client you'd like to have or an experience? I'm trying to think if there's a, is there a, a type of performance I'd like to do that I haven't had the opportunity to do, whether I made the most of it or not, did I have a chance to do that? And there's not much. Um, I, I'm exploring now. I, I produced a, a TV show down in Florida that we're going to try to sell to some uh, independent, you know, cable outlets for programming. Never done that before. That's pioneer country for me. So that's been interesting to do. Um, I'd like to do more stuff with the comics I know who are my age, who I know can just bring heavyweight shows. Mm-hmm. These people aren't famous. They're not TV stars. But I. And doing this show in Florida, I hired seven other comics to do a two-hour show at a pretty massive resort property down there. I'd forgotten how funny these people were. I knew they were funny. I wouldn't have put them on the show. Right. I knew they were headliners. I trust them in front of any audience. Watching them live, I'd forgotten how funny these people are. And I want to do more of those, more events like that. That's pretty cool. Well, there's definitely a market for everything. And I hope you got that on video. So. Oh, yeah, we taped it. Yeah. Taped it. I'm, I'll, I'll mix uh, 12 weeks of comedy. I'll, That's great. I'll mix 12, 30-minute shows out of that taping. That's great. Well, good luck with that. That sounds exciting. Right. And it is good. To, that's the one, I think if there's one downside to corporate comedy is you're, you're solo, in and out. There's no other comic before or after to, to watch or to say, oh, man, how about that? Or, or oh, how about that? It's just you got to internalize it, and then 10 minutes later you're out the door. <laughs> right. And, you know, you know, from being in the comedy club business a little bit, you uh, – you, you grow up in this business with certain people and then you lose each other mm-hmm. because you don't work together anymore. You're all headlining shows. They don't put two of you on one show. So you've got a, a comedy community out there, community that is out there that it's people you know, like, you know, they're funny. You never get to see them because you do the same thing on, on these shows. So you don't work together. That's tricky. Yeah, it is tough. That's a, part of the reason I like doing this podcast is catching up with people that I haven't got to see in a while. Um, if people want to catch up with you, it's corpjester.com corpjester.com c-o-r-p-j-e-s-t-e-r.com and that'll get you to my website and all the bio and there's video and yada 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 it's all on there for you well mark it's been great seeing you again my pleasure nice you all can't up. see the handshake but there it is the closing interview handshake there's always a handshake sometimes a high five so it's audible but <laughs> it's been great thanks buddy my pleasure 
Hope you enjoyed that episode with Mark Klein. Always good to catch up with a, a comedy buddy and a guy who's been doing it longer than me, which is always especially good for me because I can learn from guys like that and did so in that particular episode. Don't forget, uh, come out and see me at one of the fundraisers that I mentioned earlier or at the Huckabee set. If you're anywhere near Nashville, Tennessee, it's a fun night out. You get to see a live TV show taping. I warm up the crowds. Occasionally, I get to guest announce, and that's always fun. A new skill for me being an announcer on a TV show. Pretty fun stuff. And I did want to say this. If you are a Christian comedian, maybe you're not doing Christian comedy. Maybe you're not doing Christian very well. Maybe you're not doing comedy very well. Maybe you need a little tune-up in both. Uh, Think about joining me and the rest of the Christian Comedy Association in Nashville, Tennessee this summer for our annual conference. It'll take place June 3rd is a Sunday night. We kick it off with a, uh, a first-timers meetup and then a comedy show. And then we have heavy-hitting daytime keynotes and breakout sessions on how to get better at not just performing comedy and writing comedy, but marketing yourself, increasing your impact through ministry, and all kinds of other great comedy-related sessions. Uh, you can check out all the information about that at ChristianComedyAssociation.com. Again, it's June 3rd through the 5th here in Nashville, Tennessee. I heavily recommend this. It's been a uh, life changer for me, and it's made everything I've done better since 2008 when I first tapped into it. So ChristianComedyAssociation.com for that. Show notes for everything else. And I'd like to again thank our Patreon supporters, Ray Price especially, for sponsoring this episode and the Clean Comedy Challenge. I'll talk to you guys next time. Stay safe and stay funny. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit schooloflaps.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay money.